Okay, looks like we're recording. Just trying a test on this camera. Wondering how it looks, quality, sound. Wondering how everybody's doing. Welcome to Hanging Out with Paul. Um, as you may know, I am visually impaired. Um, this is really hard to talk into a camera. You have so many ideas that you want to do, and uh, it's just hard to talk into a camera. But uh, <laughs> I thought it would be so easy, but uh, it is what it is. Um, I guess I can go back as far as uh, when I was born. Um, I was diagnosed with uh, congenital glaucoma. Um, I'm pretty sure I had it while I was in my mother's womb, but at three months of age I was technically diagnosed. Uh, my eyes were... Uh, larger than normal eyes um, but at uh, age three months my mom was noticing that uh, my uh, right eye was uh, red and puffy and took me to the doctor and they did some tests and found out that I have congenital glaucoma so they did a, a basic glaucoma surgery to relieve the eye pressure but he did say that it would progress to the left eye, which it did immensely over the years. Um, basically, from what I remember, I could probably go back as far as remembering some things when I was three years old. Uh, but basically, uh, the right eye was my dominant eye, and the left eye, basically, I could just see the big H. And maybe the two letters under it. At that time it was an H and a B. And it's pretty amazing when you're visually impaired and you have low vision. And uh, When you do these eye tests you kind of memorize the chart a little bit. So um, it's it's interesting uh, uh, to, to know that your brain is remembering all this. But uh, they change them up and keep you honest. Um... But basically, in the uh, left eye, I uh, uh, could only see those few letters, and then it progressed worse, and it just I could just see light. So basically, the right eye overpowered the left eye. And right around age 7, the left eye went completely dark. Now, what the doctors tell me is the left eye uh, had glaucoma, of course, but I had an overabundance of blood vessels in the left eye and it pretty much ended up um, suffocating the eye and not nourishing the eye and the blood vessels just it's kind of complicated I had the eye pressure but at the same time they kept kept tried kept to keep it low but ended up uh, not nourishing the eye and the peripheral vision goes first is the weakest part of our eyes uh, I've been told and uh, that's why it just creeps up on you and that's why you should have eye tests yearly um, but at age 8 it was completely darkness and I just had the right eye um, I, I had a pretty good childhood you know I was you know one of my favorite uh, cartoons was Speed Racer so I would just go around on my bike speeding around crashing into things and you know i was i was a nut um it's a miracle i'm alive um but uh i did get around and my vision was you know floating around 2050 to 2040 uh when i was a child but i was very very nearsighted um but i could get around and uh as long as I was in the front row in school, which everybody 
would always want to sit in the back and I always would like, man, it would just be great to sit in the back and just not be center of attention and just kind of just be there. But I always had to sit in the front to, to see what was going on. And then as I got older and uh, was in junior high and everything, everything was fine. Uh, basically, I could see, you know, around 2040. That's what where my mark was, 2050, 2040. Um, and my visual field was, you know, right around 100 and. 10 115 degrees and nor a normal IC is 180 so I could function and uh, when it came to driving um, they uh, limited me to just daylight driving so I started spending more time with my doctors and the guy corrective lenses and was able to just barely drive at night now even though I can drive at night, that doesn't mean that necessarily uh, that I, you know, it was great. Uh, I would try to avoid it as much as possible. But when you're young and you just want to cruise the streets, I did a lot of night driving. Uh, but then as I got older, I would try to uh, avoid night driving, especially in inclement weather. Uh, uh, rain was the worst for me. Uh, rain when that streets turned to glass. Uh, it was really hard to find, see those lines. Uh, and then in the snow, it was a hit or miss. Uh, snow was very blinding, but if the roads were paved very well at the time, uh, you could differ, differentiate, uh, you know, the road and uh, the off-road part. So the road was black and the snow was white, and it helped me that way. As long as it wasn't snowing. If it was started snowing, it was just like, I don't know, driving in a cloud. Uh, it was very scary. And uh, at 21, uh, 20, 21, 22, I, I got married and uh, have two, two boys, and they're grown now, and I'm a grandfather, and uh, but as uh, right around age 35, my eye started failing, the right eye, the left eye was blind in, but the, the right eye started failing, the cornea started failing. So I um, ended up seeing, um, it was like looking, one day I just woke up and uh, it was like looking at a glass of, of milk. Uh, and I panicked. And um, I needed to find out what was going on. And I actually drove in that condition. It was crazy. I know. It was a miracle I made it to the doctor's office, but I did. And they uh, said that I have a small tear in the cornea and I'm getting condensation in the cornea and I need a transplant. So they gave me drops to try to clear that stuff up. But uh, sometimes, depending on the strength of the dosage or... Uh, just the way my eye would be particularly acting that day, uh, I would have double, sometimes triple vision. Uh, I ended up working like this um, because I knew my craft very well. That pretty much I, you know, the things that you do, you you trust what you do, and uh, I had people around me that would help me to verify what I think everything looks like. I, I was a printer. <laughs> Um, uh, so then I ended up having the cornea transplant and it was a long process and it took about a year to recover, but I was back, um, even better. Uh, my vision was clear. Uh, I was actually 2030, which I never was before and, um, started to see a lot better than when I used to see. Uh, so I was at 2030. Sometimes I would get the 2025 line, which was crazy. Um, but, you know, just chucked through and was working. And uh, after about 14 years, that cornea started failing. So I had to have a second one. 
And this one was less invasive. It was very interesting how they did it. Um, so uh, I did that, and it was only a two-week process. And then uh, my vision came back about the same, 2030, and was back to work. And having these cornea transplants, um, there were risks to, that my glaucoma would be aggravated again because it, it did go dormant for a while. For a good measure, I would take eye drops, but pretty much it was quiet. Well, after these cornea transplants at age 35 and then around 42, 43, I ended up uh, aggravating the glaucoma and I had to attack it with vengeance with uh, eye drops, but I had to have this special uh, surgery done where they, um, they make like a little incision in the eye uh, underneath the eyelid towards the iris and pupil it's like a triangular cut and then there's another triangular cut meeting that triangle making like a diamond and there's a like a little tiny hole underneath my eyelid so I could you know just go like this and gently just touch the eye and reduce the eye pressure that way along with my drops now that worked wonderful um, it kept my pressure way below normal. Normal's around 14, 15. But because of my situation, and I only have one eye, they want to just make sure for good measure I'm a little under that. So I was floating around 10, 11, 12 uh, for eye pressure. Um, and that went well for about ooh, two or three years. And then the glaucoma started... Uh, acting up again. Uh, no, it was more like nine years, I think. Uh, what happened was that little bleb under my eye started scarring over and uh, was not releasing the eye pressure. So I had to go into routine surgery. It was uh, just routine. It's called a needling. And uh, my uh, physician would just poke a needle in that uh, uh, bleb underneath my eyelid and just poke that membrane just uh, so that uh, eye pressure can be released. Um, the danger of it was only about 2%, and guess what? Uh, I was the 2%. That evening, my eye started not recuperating from the eye pressure, and it started getting dangerously low, and it actually went down to zero. And my eye was collapsing. And the horrific pain that went behind that was, I just wanted somebody to knock me out with a baseball bat. It only lasted for a little while. I've heard people that have been in the hospital for weeks with this kind of pain and, and you know, just for the simple reason that they can't even eat. So they just need uh, to be on an IV uh, so they don't get dehydrated and have some kind of nourishment. Uh, I was lucky in that point. Uh, my pain only lasted for only a half hour, and then when it finally subsided, I was so relieved. Uh, I ended up uh, getting out of bed like I normally do in the middle of the night, and, uh, you know, you, you don't want to turn the lights on, so you know your bedroom, you know your bathroom, you just find your way. And then when I went to the bathroom to turn the light switch on, no lights. So I asked my girlfriend, I said, um, I said, honey, is the, the, the lights out? Did the bulbs burn out? She goes, no, they're on. And I said, realized what had happened. And the first thing out of my mouth was, I'm done. My eye's done. And I'm done. So the fear started where everything is dark. And I couldn't tell if it was light or day. The only reason why I would know if it was daytime was if I was close to a window or outside and I could feel the sun. Otherwise, I didn't know if it was day or night. And it was a very scary time. So my doctors were working vigilantly to try to, to find out what's going on. And what happened was my eye hemorrhaged behind my retina. Now, here's a fun fact. 
behind the retina, the retina is in the back of the eye wall, but behind the retina there is what you call a choroid or choroid area, choroidal, I think it's choroid. Uh, that little tiny area per square inch is more blood vessels than any organ in your body. Now, I always thought the liver had the most, which it does, but per square inch, there are more blood vessels than anywhere else in your body than in that choroid area, right behind your retina that rests against the back of your eye wall where your optic nerve is. So when my eye hemorrhaged, I ended up uh, aggravating those blood vessels because the eye is collapsing and... Uh, uh, ended up hemorrhaging and my eye filled with blood. And I regained some eye pressure, but that was just because I had blood in, in the eye. Now, this isn't just like, you know, watery blood, like you cut your finger with a knife and you're like, you know, ah, oh, and you, you know, it, it's all watery. In the eye, it starts out watery, but it immediately coagulates and turns to like peanut butter. So now you have to be very delicate and careful on what's going on with the eye. So I saw a retina specialist who I had back in the past when I had my two cornea transplants before just to monitor the, the retina. And what had happened was the uh, choroid area swelled up from all the blood vessels bleeding and actually pushed my retina forward and twisted around and was all the way into my iris and so I don't have light now going through the pupil to the retina it's all distorted and on top of it I have all the blood in there so now what do you do so it's not like they can just go in and drain the blood and you're good as new because if they do something right this very minute and any type of incision on the eye the eye would just explode because of the pressure from the blood inside being so solid. So I have to do the waiting game. So I have to let my body absorb this blood little by little. And then we start looking at the eye and making sure that, you know, the retina is okay right now. They can't even tell if it's torn, detached, uh, destroyed. So we have to wait. So we wait about four, three weeks, four weeks. And the retina specialist looks at the eye and ends up um, deciding that uh, we need to have, do some surgery, but we're going to play. Uh, now, my retina specialist, he's a, he's a base, one of his hobbies is he's a baseball coach. And I, I'm a football fan, but I, I like baseball too. But so I understood, I said, you know, that we're going to play what you call small ball. I'm not going to hit the home run. I have one retina specialist saying I have one chance, one chance only. And when that moment's there, we should just swing for the fences. But uh, I had a second opinion, and this one was more cautious. And he was a, a retina specialist I had in the past, so he knows me a little so I decided, well, I want my sight back now, but we have to play small ball. So what he ended up doing was I had surgery, and they made two incisions in the back of the eye, went underneath the, the eyelid. I think it was at the bottom or top. It really doesn't matter. But uh, they went to the back of the eye, and he made two small incisions like you would take a paring knife into an onion. And just take a couple slivers here and there. And let the eye slowly drain that way. At that point, it was safe to do that because the eye, uh, wasn't, there was no threat to, for it to explode and for it to naturally uh, drain. He drained a little bit, but didn't want to drain too much himself because uh, out, the retina could come out with the blood. So... We didn't know where the retina was. He wanted to be very careful where he had to make his incisions. So I had that surgery, and it was successful, and I had to play the waiting game again. And let it slowly, slowly drain. 
After about a month of that, I ended up uh, having a second surgery where he went in there and now it's full boat. They're going to go inside. He's looking at the eye. It's hard, still hard to see with the examinations, but he can see the retina. He thinks it's now detached and that we need to go in there and try to clean out some more blood and reattach the retina back to the choroid area. The theory is they'll just let the blood drain and then the, the retina will slowly go back to its position, um, kind of retract, if you will, into position. And if there's any little corner here or there that's detached, he could repair it. So we were at that point, <clears throat> and he went in um, five weeks later and ended up going inside the eye, removed part of the gel so that he can get his tools in there. Uh, and uh, reattach the retina. Uh, to his amazement, uh, everything was fine. The retina wasn't detached. There were no tears, no holes. He was, he was in amazement. So he just cleaned out the eye the best he could, sewed me up, and I had a patch for a day or two. And when I took the patch off, um, I could see a little bit. And we just you know, monitored it for a few months, and uh, I ended up getting my sight back, only a part of it. I was thinking that, oh, I'm great, I'm going to go back to work, and, you know, this is, you know, I'm going to be back to normal. And uh, ended up uh, only seeing, after tests, a normal eye sees 180 degrees, uh, during my whole life, I would see a right around 110, 115, and to drive a car, being blind in one eye and seeing out of the other, the minimum was 105 degrees. Uh, when this was all done, uh, I can only see less than 5 degrees. So I have major, major, major tunnel vision. However, I do have some 